So we left off talking about France and how uh, they are going to be going towards absolutism um, as we see Louis XIII and Karl Richelieu being uh, the ones to continue in centralizing the monarch's power. Um, we mentioned from the English Civil War, right, the, at the point where you had the Stuart dynasty in power, believing in divine right, um, that will kind of fall apart because of Cromwell, um, but they, um, Parliament is going to, you know, bring in the idea that you should have a constitutional government instead. So um, this is kind of coming back to England again. The Glorious Revolution is going to um, reject absolutism, and um, for a period of time after uh, Cromwell um, has ruled, right, they're going to restore Charles II, um, and it's going to go back to the time where the Stuarts are in power again. So um, it's kind of an interesting thing is because they're on the path towards constitutionalism, but then because of kind of the um, extreme um, approach and results of the English Civil War, it really uh, made them feel that they cannot, you know, go to that point of just having a pure republic, okay? Um, so at this point, uh, England has now returned to the status quo of 1642, uh, where you do have um, a hereditary uh, monarch and um, parliament uh, is going to be um, summoned at certain points to acquire her money. The Anglican Church is currently in power once again and it has bishops. Um, and so the struggle between parliament and the monarch is going to be highlighted through the last few stewards, and finally it's going to fall apart. Okay, um, So um, the, the monarch that is restored is Charles II. Um, he's going to reign from 1660 to 1685. Um, and so Charles, if he accepted to be restored, he had to abide by the decisions that Parliament's going to make. Um, so a few things about Parliament is that uh, Parliament was stronger in relation to the king than ever before in England. Usually it's kind of like a tag team and, um, you know, the balance has always been a struggle and a tug of war between, uh, but this is for sure that's understood that the king's power is not absolute. And so um, Charles had to agree to a significant degree of religious toleration, um, especially for Catholics to whom he was very partial to. Okay, so. Um, he's associated as Anglican, but he's very partial to Catholics, and so remember his um, dad was the one that got executed, um, and at this point, he is now the new king because he's the rightful heir, and how will this turn out, okay? So he's partial to um, Catholics, and he pre he's pretty tolerant of, for religion. He actually believes that you know all can worship no matter, you know, whether you're Catholic or Puritan, right, or Anglican, the main thing is that you have to be loyal to me, okay? Um, he was known as kind of this merry monarch. That was kind of his nickname because he had a very uh, friendly uh, personality, okay? And during the time um, of the Restoration, we're going to see two political parties actually develop. These are the first two um, actual political parties, not just um, groups, but um, you have the Tories, which is the first one, and uh, essentially they are the upper class, they are the nobles, they are the landed gentry, they, they own property, okay, land owners, they're Anglican, that's something to understand about the Tories, and so overall they're going to be associated as the more conservative camp um, because they're, they're, they're supporting the monarch um, over parliament, okay, so their loyalty lies with the monarchy. Um, Anglicans um, did not believe that um, you are allowed to worship a different or worship you know in a Puritan way and still be loyal to the king. They felt that if you're English, right, then you can be Anglican and you'd be loyal to the king. That's kind of one package. You can't separate loyalty and religion. Okay, so that's the Tories. Don't mix those up with the Cavaliers. It's, it's very different, okay? Um, at this time, Parliament is, you know, um, a mix between Tories and Whigs. Okay, Whigs is our second uh, political group. Um, this party is predominantly middle class, and um, they're mainly Puritan. So you have Tories, right, upper class, nobles, um, Anglican, Whigs, middle class Puritans, and they're going to favor Parliament over 
the king for power. Um, they're going to look for religious toleration, obviously, because they're Puritans. They're not kind of like, um, the Puritans are, are, are a larger group, but they're not as big as the Anglicans. And so they're associated to be more liberal in the classical sense, not like extremely liberal, just in the idea that they're more open to change, okay? Um, so at this point, Charles is kind of um, in support of Catholicism. He believes, you know, just give them the freedom of worship. And a lot of Whigs are going to kind of, you know, give a lot of question to that because Puritans are like super anti-Catholic, okay? All right, so a few factors of under um, religion. Um, you have in 1661 um, to 65, the Clarendon Code. Um, this was instituted uh, by those in support of the monarchy, specifically, um, of course, the Tories and their Anglican, okay? Um, what is their goal? Well, they want to drive all Catholics Puritans, Presbyterians, basically non-Anglicans, out of both political and religious life. And so they're going to put penalties on those that are attending non-Anglican worship services. Okay, so they're kind of targeting them specifically. Um, that's the first one. Um, and then, um, then Charles II is going to um, announced the Declaration of Indulgence. And so um, this is in 1672. And so in good faith, right, towards Louis XIV, who England and France actually um, don't want to have a good relationship with, um, he wanted to basically suspend the laws against Catholics. So you know what? We had laws against Catholics, Clarendon Code. I'll remove it, right? And, and by doing so, uh, France is going to give England money each year for Charles to remove these types of laws. And so even Louis is trying to promote Catholicism through this. Okay, And then we have um, the Test Act in 1673 that comes out. And this is going to exclude those that are unwilling to follow the Anglican Church's sacraments. Okay, So if you're unwilling to follow the sacraments of the Anglican Church, you are now um, unable to vote, you're unable to hold office, you're not allowed to preach, you're not allowed to teach, go to universities, or assemble meetings, okay? And so because of this, you kind of see a back and forth type of thing between Parliament and Charles II and saying, oh, I want to, you know, like, um, put limitations on Catholicism. That's what Parliament is saying. And then Charles II is coming back and saying, you know, we should have more tolerance in this. And so it's making, you know, a, a Parliament really upset because of this. Um, another thing, is um, his younger brother, James II. Uh, he is actually associated to be Catholic. He affiliates himself that way. And on his deathbed, Charles II declares himself to be a Catholic in the end. Okay, A um, couple of things right before Charles II is about to die. Um, first is that uh, he's going to dissolve Parliament several times. He's going to say, you know, we're going to close you off. We don't need you anymore, okay? You're constantly going against my power and authority, okay? Um, and then Parliament is going to fire back and pass the Habeas Corpus Act, really important, 1679. Um, this is where um, the Whigs really said, you know what, we want Parliament to hold the power. We should limit the monarch. And what the Habeas Corpus Act is saying is that judges um, should be able to, um, in court, demand that prisoners are there present, Okay. Um, there must be a just cause to be thrown in prison. Uh, you must provide a speedy trial. You can't drag it out. Um, you cannot be um, convicted and charged for a crime that you've already been acquitted. That's what we call double jeopardy. Okay. So different things about laws and being thrown in prison through so the Habeas Corpus, uh, Corpus Act. And that's going to be another thing the parliament is going to be using as a document um, to draft the constitution. Okay. Um, sorry, I didn't pull that up. All right. Um, and last thing about Charles II is that um, as far as Scotland, this territory, um, Scotland's going to gain its independence in 1660. Um, but then in 1661, Charles II actually declares himself as the head of the Church of Scotland. That really um, makes him upset because he's supposed to be, he's supporting Catholicism, where Scotland are Presbyterian. And so uh, that, that point... Uh, they don't want to follow his hierarchical system of church. You're not the head. We have Presbyteries instead. Okay, and so um, they obviously Scotland does not like the monarchy as well. Okay, then comes younger brother James the second. Okay, only a little bit to talk about him. Um, 
James II came to the throne in 1685. Um, it was a really like it was, it was a political crisis in the sense where you know it was a tug of war between Parliament and the monarchy, and religion is going to be another cause of conflict between the king and the Parliament at that time. So what's going to happen? Well, he came to the throne at age 55 because he's just a young brother; he's not the son. Okay, so um, his brother dies. He's kind of old at this point. Um, James II was 15 years old when his dad Charles I was executed, and he you know, he's a very stubborn guy. Okay, and that's gonna you know hurt him, um, and so his goal eventually was to restore England to be a Catholic country again. Now, I mean that's that's a lot to say after coming all the way from Henry VIII has you know broken off from Catholicism and become Anglican. James II very ambitious, right? So what led to his downfall is that uh, he began to have conflicts with Parliament because Parliament does not want to have a Catholic king, let alone a Catholic country. Okay. Um, also, he goes against the Test Act, which we mentioned, okay, um, which was putting limitations on um, Catholic freedoms, um, for toleration for them. And so, in the end, we see that there are different factors that led to his downfall. The first one was that he ordered for the Declaration of Indulgence, which we read in 1672, right? That should be read in the Anglican Church, right? So supporting Catholic toleration in the Anglican Church is really upsetting to the Anglicans. And um, most of the clergy is going to refuse and say, what are you doing? He's going to imprison bishops. And at that point, right, it's seen that, hey, you know what? This guy, he's antagonizing the Anglican Church. Like, we don't want him. Right, he's totally Catholic, and he's just crossed the line. He's gone too far. Um, in addition, he's going to, in 1688, have a son. Okay, and so he already has two daughters, but he's going to have a son, um, and his wife is Catholic as well. And so this is kind of like the breaking point where Parliament says, "Well, this is the heir to the throne," and so. Is our country going to really turn Catholic? I mean, he's already Catholic. His wife's Catholic. The son's probably going to be raised Catholic. We got to put an end to this. So what are we going to do? Okay. So I'm going to direct you um, to this family tree. Um, I have a picture of Charles II here. So this is where we started with under the Restoration. Remember, Charles I um, was was executed. Okay. One thing I want to insert here, just really quickly, is that to remember what's happening in the Glorious Revolution and also English Civil War is you have to remember. We're having a Cromwell sandwich. Okay, what that means is that you have James I, Charles I, and then Oliver Cromwell comes in the middle because he comes and executes Charles I. But after Cromwell um, rules for some time, setting up the protectorate, right, and um, then he is going to die. They're going to re restore Charles II to the throne, and then James II is going to come. So it's like a sandwich, right? James is on the top and bottom, then you have the Charleses, and then you have Cromwell right in the middle. Um, so that's where, where Charles II is at, and then you have him die off, James II takes over, and there you see his, his son, James Stuart, who's going to be James III, unless Parliament does anything about it. Well, Parliament kind of has their eyes upon William III. So if you look under William II um, and Mary, right, they have a son, William III. Um, he's called William of Orange because he is from Holland. Um, he is nephew to James II. Okay, and so um, Charles is Charles the first has a daughter Mary, right, right there, and so Mary has her son William the third. Okay, all right. So how does Parliament address this? Okay, um, William the third is going to marry James the second oldest daughter, which is Mary. Okay, and so yes, they're cousins. Um, one thing to know is that Mary and Anne, as you see, Mary II and Anne right there, they're both Protestant. Um, why would you marry your cousin? Back then, it's, it's, it's a different culture. The reasonings are different, and I'll kind of explain that. But that's what happens, okay? We have focus in our attention right now on William the Third and Mary the Second, okay? And yes, they're cousins, but they're going to get married, and Parliament is going to look to them to take over instead of James Stuart the Third, okay? All right, so... Um, the Glorious Revolution is going to be a major event. It's called Glorious because of the turn of events, the results of what happens in the end. So from 1688 to 1689 is when the Glorious Revolution takes place. And it's kind of the final act in this whole political struggle in England, um, kind of tying it up 
and seeing a clear distinction of how for now no longer going towards absolutism, going away from that, going towards constitutionalism. Um, Parliament, they're not willing to sacrifice their constitutional gains in the English Civil War, right? They, they've become to gain more power over time, and they do not want to return to an absolute monarchy. Um, so Parliament had two major concerns. The first one was, hey, why are you reading this um, Declaration of Indulgence for Catholics or supporting Catholics in the Anglican Church? One, we don't want, we don't like that. Okay. Um, two, we don't want to have a Catholic king. And with James the Third lying around, okay, we got to do something about this. So they begin to invite uh, William of Orange in some talks, right? So you have some Parliament members that say, you know what? Hey, you're the nephew. You're also the son-in-law. You're going to be marrying, right? Your cousin, Mary. That's kind of weird to us, right? Back then it was okay. Um, at that point. Um, William's rationale, his justification for doing so, was that um, he wanted to have um, basically using the English resources to be funding his Dutch army. Okay, um, he wants to um, attack Louis the Fourteenth, right? So the Netherlands and France are at war at this point, and so he saw an opportunity saying, when I fight Louis XIV, I'm going to use England's resources, and I don't really care so much about being the husband to my cousin, however, um, at that point, I'm willing to do so, okay? So he brings in 15,000 troops in November 1688, and at that point where he's going to invade, we think war is going to happen, but actually James II is going to flee. Okay, and so he goes to France, he flees, and, he's, and at this point, uh, William and Mary are going to be crowned King and Queen of England, and um, it's called the Glorious Revolution because there is little bloodshed at all because of, you know, usually revolutions take a full-on war to bring change. Um, some of the reforms that come, the changes that come through the Glorious Revolution, one, Parliament can set up um, the own bank, the Bank of England, and also a free press. These things have, um, were not... Really implemented until you know Parliament's in control of these things now, um, and then the most important thing is this document, the English Bill of Rights. Okay, so the English Bill of Rights comes in 1689. Um, England is now officially a constitutional monarchy. Okay, one thing I want to mention is that if we remember the Petition of Right, okay, during the back in James one, Charles one days, right, Habeas Corpus Act 1679, just went over that, and now the Bill of Rights 1689. Uh, these three documents are all part of the English Constitution, right? So you kind of need to see how, the progress of how Parliament has been able to um, demand power and maintain it through these these major laws. Okay, all right. So what are the actual provisions? What does the English Bill of Rights actually say? What are these rights that are entitled to Parliament? Okay, one, uh, the king cannot be a Roman Catholic. Two, laws can only be made with the consent of Parliament. Three, Parliament had a right of free speech. Um, if the king wants to set up a standing army for, for England, they must have consent from Parliament as well. And taxes also must ha be given consent from Parliament. If not, then it's illegal. Um, cruel and unusual punishment, excessive bails cannot be put upon any people. Um, and Parliament should be given free elections. It should not be rigged. Uh, the king cannot just put people into parliament for no reason, they must be elected, okay? And um, these are kind of the, the, the important parts, very political in terms of rights. However, the main thing that the Bill of Rights did not tackle is the religious questions. And so the Toleration Act of 1689, okay, is going to answer kind of what parliament can do about the religious struggles, right? And so uh, the Toleration Act says that uh, Puritans have the right of free and public worship, however, Catholics do not, right? So there's this um, religious intolerance towards Catholics still. Um, the Test Act was not repealed, so what that means is that uh, you have freedom of worship, but then you do not have full civil and political equality for Puritans, okay? Catholics don't even think about it. All right, so the significance um, I do want to bring up. So the Glorious Revolution um, did not eventually create a democratic revolution. Okay, do not mix this up with, let's say, the French Revolution, where we're going to see right a huge political and social change, or even the American Revolution. Uh, the Glorious Revolution was really not so much about democracy, 
right? But it was more about uh, power to parliament, okay? So parliament essentially is represented in the upper classes, and we're going to see that in the upper classes you have the nobility and the landowners, the landed gentry, they're going to be holding most of the power up until the mid-1800s. Um, the majority of English people are not going to have their own power, and so remember democracy is the power of the people. And so we're not going to see that people are actually participating in government at this point. It's just that the power has shifted from the monarchy into um, a constitutional representative government. Okay, all right. Um, <clears throat> John Locke uh, he actually wrote uh, a book, the two treatises of government um, articles. Uh, this is um, in defense of the Glorious Revolution, in supporting it um, as um, a political philosopher himself, he, he really stated that, well, you know, people um, should create a government that protects their natural rights, uh, life, liberty, property, right? If and when the government does not provide and look over these rights, then they have the right to rebel and overthrow the government. So that's exa exactly what happened. Uh, Parliament was not given, you know, the rights to the rights to life, liberty, property, and at that point they felt entitled to do so, and so this is confirmation of, hey, this was the right move to make. Okay, um, so the significance of the Glorious Revolution, some of the things that came out of it is that it cleared the suspicion of possibly even having a parliamentary government as kind of your lead power. Um, it cleared the suspicion also of the rule of law that kings would be checked by the rule of law. This was upheld, okay? Um, it supported uh, the right of rebellion against tyranny, and that's essentially the, the glory of it, right? It's called the Glorious Revolution because the rebellion was successful, okay? Um, it ended the idea of divine right, at least in England, okay? And it established the idea of a constitutional government that is, you know, generated by their own drafted constitution. And from that, right, many countries are going to look to England and say, hey, wow, look, look at them, change of the government, we should see that as an example, okay? All right, I'm going to go back to the family tree really quickly. Um, I do want to point out a few things. So you have William III, Mary II, they are William of Mary, okay, he's William of Orange from the Orange family um, from the Netherlands. They rule for some time, okay. Um, Mary's going to die in 1694, as you can see. Um, she's going to die of smallpox, and eventually um, it comes to the point where, you know, they don't have children, what's going to happen, okay, and so the Act uh, of settle Settlement in 1701 um, is going to decide how will the monarchy be passed on, okay, so after um, William and Mary rule, right, then you have Anne, who's the younger sister of Mary, um, and Parliament is considering this, right? Like, there's this James the Third Stuart that's around. Um, he obviously wants to take the throne. He feels like he's the rightful heir, but Parliament does not want to have a Catholic king. So, um, if they don't have any kids, they don't have an heir. What's going to happen? The Act of Settlement says, "Hey, you know what? We're going to skip over the Stuarts. Once Anne dies and her children are no more, okay, um, it's now going to be passed over to Sophia." from the House of Hanover, right, Sophia and Ernest, and so the House of Hanover is from Germany, um, but they're married into kind of the Stuarts, and so at that point, Anne's going to die in 1714, and George I is going to be the first um, Hanoverian king, and so the Act of Settlement has decided that no descendants of James II could be a monarch, and so that's why they have this little tag that's called the Pretenders, and so even though um, they claim themselves as the rightful heirs. They are just called the pretenders because they don't really have that authority. They don't have that backing. Um, and so at this point, you know, um, they're going to be trying to claim um, their rightful place, but then they're always going to be um, rejected for that. Okay. All right, last thing just to cover up really quickly. Um, Queen Anne Stuart, a few things that come under her rule. 1707, um, she's going to be ruling for, you know, I think about 10 years, 12 years or so. Um, because she is the last Stuart monarch, right, in the Stuart dynasty we know that they are anti-parliament. Um, from this point, the power of the monarch is, has pretty much decreased, parliament has increased in power, um, and in 1707, the United Kingdom is going to be established where Scotland is going to agree to be joining um, 
England to create the United Kingdom of Britain. And so a few things is that um, Scotland joined uh, to create this United Kingdom um, because for one, they saw there's a lot of a lot of economic advantages. The British East India Company, all the different colonies England has obtained at this point, um, the shrunk system of mercantilism, and also the Navigation Acts. These are all things that have supported the strong economy and growing economy um, in England. And Scotland wanted to have a piece of that. If they didn't join, they wouldn't have these types of um, abilities and opportunities to grow as their own country. Um, in addition, their concern really was, hey, if the Stuarts were, who were originally from Scotland, if they claim to be kings of Scotland again, and they're Catholic and we're Presbyterian, what's going to happen? We don't want that. And so um, by agreeing to this, um, they essentially were able to say, well, we're going to keep our Presbyterian church, right? So we're happy with that, right? And um, we can keep our own laws of church and how that's going to go because you have Presbyterians, which are a little bit different from Puritans. And then you have, of course, the Anglicans are still there. So they, they felt like they got what they wanted and they're happy with that. Um, all right. So what ends up happening is uh, the government of... of of Scotland and the Parliament of England is going to merge together and now they have created the United Kingdom.